No. Um, Clive and I have known each other for some years. Clive was one of the founding members of the Institute way back when, 21 years ago. Um, we've just had a wonderfully wide-ranging conversation over uh, tea and coffee beforehand about things like whether the Scots accept any responsibility for um, what went wrong with the Scottish banks. Of course we don't. It all happened in London. Um, and a number of other issues. Oh, welcome. Um, I'm going to leave Clive to it because this promises to be a fascinating session. We'd ideally like to do questions at the end, but I'm sure if there's a pressing one in between times, uh, Clive will happily take it or comments. If you do have questions or comments, can you please wait for a microphone to get to you so that people watching this later on somewhere outside London or in uh, many empires uh, outside Britain can hear what you're saying properly. Clive, thank you. Thank you, George, uh, for that warm introduction. Um, I was here just over a year ago, uh, and I gave a talk entitled Revolution versus Evolution, um, where I tried to allude to some of the things that I'm going to talk on today. And there were comments raised on that day, and a certain amount of criticism, valid uh, indeed, that what I told was a, a partial story, and I did volunteer that this was a work in progress. And what I've come back to do, to do today is to try and expand on what I talked about a year ago uh, and hopefully enlighten you as to some of the things that I've learned over the last year. Uh, and I've, I've learned a lot from an, an awful lot of people. I'm going to be dealing with some concepts at a fairly high level which may be completely alien to you. And I will apologise in advance because I may not be able to clarify them fully, but hopefully we can do a bit in the Q&A afterwards. But uh, what I am doing is providing links to sources where you can actually go and look much deeper because it's taken me quite a while to get my head around some of these things and I don't expect anyone coming at this afresh to just take it as read. I think it requires a certain amount of digging. One, of the, one book which sort of led me on this road of trying to understand the context of our civilization today in terms of previous civilizations is um, a book by Ronald Wright called A Short History of Progress, which is a very easy read, and I would recommend it. You know, it wouldn't take long to read. It's only a thin book. But in there, he, he uses a phrase which I think is very telling and very true, and that is, every time history repeats itself, the price goes up. Uh, and that's really what I wanted to talk about today. Um, I don't need any, I d you don't need me to tell you that we're in a, a bit of a mess at the moment. We have, we have a number of competing imperatives, all of which seem to be mutually exclusive. Um, I don't know if you, any, any of you have seen a, a recent article over the last few days by Nouriel Rubini. Um, who was talking about, he's just come back from a trip around the world, and he does a sort of resume of all the problems across the globe, which makes pretty depressing reading, which I know is his, his forte. But um, what we have is a situation where we cannot increase debt, because clearly debt is too high to, to create fiscal stimulus, um, and we cannot, uh, we don't have enough consumption. There is demand, people want to go out and buy stuff, but people have reducing incomes. And so we're, we're caught in this, in this paradigm trap, for want of a better description, where there appears to be no reasonable way out. Um, and just as a matter of interest, can I just by a show of hands, how many people think that current policies are working and will get us out of the current situation? Excellent. We have at least two. Um, how many people think that there are solutions but they're not being applied? There are solutions within the current situation that could be applied that aren't being, being applied and would work. Yeah. Thank you. That, that's interesting because I think like most people, it's difficult to see how we get out of this current situation. And we have been here before. And one of the problems about history repeating itself and the price going up is what the consequences of that may be. Now, people could dismiss the riots in 2011 as merely a product of hooligans and, and, and just people jumping on the bandwagon to get free stuff. But all revolutions start with the young 
revolting for no particular reason, not really knowing why they're revolting, but it's a measure of discontent. We see more structured protest across Greece, Italy, Spain, Portugal, and of course there was the Occupy movement. And it, it can't be for no reason that the US commissioned Halliburton to create internment camps across America, detention centers, to, to hold up to two million people. That's on top of the two million prison population they already incarcerate. So clearly, this is a potential threat to our current civilization. The other great threat to our civilization, which is only too poignant at present with what's going on in, in Southeast Asia, is the threat of war. Prior to World War II, the world was going through, and particularly the Western world, was going through one of the deepest depressions it had ever experienced. American unemployment peaked at about uh, 21%. Currently, there are 47.5 million family, uh, people in America actually on food stamps. And although the unemployment numbers may look more encouraging, and certainly the data that we see might give one cause for encouragement, there are people holding down two or three jobs just to survive. But I actually think there, are, there is considerable cause for hope and optimism. But actually, unbeknown to me, at least a year ago, or more than a year ago, two or three years ago, that these flaws in our economic system have been known about for many years. It's not as if we're facing something new. These, these structural flaws have existed long before what is regarded as the sort of neoliberal development of the last 30 years. People have conducted extensive diagnosis and prescriptions have been based on study of past civilizations, how they grew, how they, how they collapsed and the causes. And there is much greater awareness as evidenced by a lot of the popular protest movements and, and think, think tanks, not the conventional think tanks, but I'm talking about grassroots think tanks that are discussing these sorts of ideas and information that I'm going to discuss today. And of course, None of this would have been possible without the internet. There is access to just so much information, a hell of a lot of misinformation, and one needs to sift accordingly. And it's provided the communication so people can work across national and cultural barriers. And there is a, there is a great desire for change. And, and all of that, I think, leads me to feel that, that there is hope. Whereas perhaps two years ago, I couldn't actually see how we were going to get out of, the, out of our current situation. So let's talk about the flaws in our economy. Now this man at the top, Henry George, wrote Progress in Poverty in 1879. It was the product of many years' study of what was going on in America. It was, it was, the, un, it was the rolling out of, of the American dream. He was traveling around America and, and witnessing great prosperity. But everywhere he went, it was accompanied by abject poverty. And he couldn't understand why. And so he set about trying to understand the economic system that created this state of affairs. And he came to the conclusion that it was the private capture of land and resources that created this mismatch because it allowed what was formerly common, commonly held by everyone for everybody's benefit, it allowed a few individuals or corporations to actually capture that, that wealth and prosperity for themselves, leaving those who have been dispossessed on the poverty line. Now, I tried to read Progress and Poverty um, initially, and I struggled because it's not an easy book. And I, I came across this book by Fred Harrison called The Traumatized Society. And he explains how if you go back to the sort of 1500s when the monasteries were confiscated by Henry VIII, there was this, there's been this long dispossession from the land with the enclosures, uh, both in this country and in Scotland and Ireland, where people were removed from the land. They removed, we were removed from our contact with the land, and that has led to deep-suited trauma. And this has been obscured by our economics, which actually ignores land. And I did go back to Progress and Poverty, and I've read it twice since. And actually, if you get to grips with it, our understanding of economics is totally myopic, for want of a better word, about the, the effects of this, this land issue. 
It's also myopic in terms of other issues, but this, this issue in particular has been expunged from the economic discourse. There was actually quite a strong movement around the time of Lord George, uh, Lloyd George, um, to actually promote the idea of capturing land value. Um, but it was quickly squashed by those who had a vested interest in the status quo. Fred Harrison uh, try, has been trying to tell this story to government, civil servants, academics and others for 40 years or more. And he, he tried to tell Tony Blair that there was this 18-year property-led cycle. Uh, and he could demonstrate it empirically. It, w it wasn't as if it was some sort of theory out of nothing. But it was ignored and we know what happened to no more boom and bust. Just to put this into context, up until about the 1500s, about 100% of the surplus or profit from the land was shared for the public good. Um, by the early 19th century, it had reduced to around 4%. And that, to some extent, reflects the next floor or, or influenced the next floor. Because as these people were pushed off the land, they were pushed into work which gives us our second major flaw. And this is one that is so deep-rooted in our psychology that it is extremely difficult to get one's head around. Um, there was a lot of work done in the 30s by C.H. Douglas and the social credit movement, which was actually raised by someone in the audience at my last talk, and I knew very little about it at that stage. But this idea that our, our existence on this planet can only be mandated on the basis of us actually having paid employment is a huge lie. Because if you, if you actually think about productivity from, actually I've got one of these clever pointers, yeah. If you, if you think from the start of the Industrial Revolution, you look at that productivity curve and the population curve and the productivity curve, the idea that we can create full employment is just, this defies logic. Why would we want to? How many non-jobs are there in our economy? And I'm not going to be specific because I would risk offending quite a large number of people about the sort of non-jobs that I'm talking about. But certainly there's a lot of destructive jobs in the environment. So these two flaws of themselves are bad enough. And what I talked about a year ago has been layered over the top of that. And that's our banking system, which is based on interest. Uh, and I did talk about this lady a year ago, Margaret Kennedy, who wrote her book, Interest in Inflation-Free Money, in 1995. Uh, and I'm going to go into the findings of her book in more detail in a minute. But actually what interest does is it creates the opportunity to bank, for banks to create money from nothing through the fractional reserve banking system. Now, a year ago, I explained that in fair detail. And at the time... I think most people I talked to about fractional reserve banking had a look of incredulity on their, on, their, on their faces. But it's now actually become common discourse in the Financial Times. The IMF issued a paper last summer called the Chicago Plan Revisited, which talked about full reserve banking. Um, so fractional reserve banking allows banks to create money from nothing, and what that translates to in the UK is that 97% of our money supply is bank-created as debt, uh, and behind that link is a lot of information on positive money, who put some excellent material together, uh, videos, books, etc. Um, so if you want to check out the detail of what I've said on that basis, I would urge you to go and look at that. But let's think about interest of itself. Everybody pays interest. Whether you go to the shop and buy food, whether you buy a train ticket, there is a capital cost element in almost everything you buy represented by interest. And what Margaret Kennedy found was that up to 50% of the average purchase, and remember this was 20 years ago, um, was actually represented by interest. But interest doesn't treat everybody equally. And she split the West German uh, population, this is from 1982, pre-unification. Um, she split the population into deciles by income. And the first eight deciles, the, the first 80%, paid, 
paid twice as much interest as they received. The top decile, the top 10%, received twice as much as they paid. So in effect, the lowest 80% were paying all their interest to the top 10%. And it's built into this curve, this exponential curve. Exponential because the top 1% go way through the roof, 15 times that height. The top 0.01% goes 2,000 times that height. It's an exponential curve, mechanical inequality. It's driven by the system. The mechanics drive the inequality on an exponential scale. The other characterization, uh, character of interest is that it grows exponentially. This is a 21-year period from 1968 to 1989, again for West Germany, when German wages and uh, salaries of, of workers were less than 400%. The federal income was also less than 400%, and yet interest payments rose by 1,360%. The debt interest accelerates faster than our ability to generate sufficient income to pay it. And there's a very good reason for that. It, it's, it's quite simple. When money is created as debt, the loan is issued for the principal, and that is what creates money. The principal is created, not, not the interest. And so in order to supply sufficient interest to the system, more debt needs to be created. And that manifests itself in private finance initiatives, student finance, they're talking about debt, care, uh, debt for care for the elderly, climate change debt. Ever, new reason, ever more new reasons are thought up to create debt. The other exponential fact about our system is that we need exponential economic growth. We as investment professionals think we understand exponential growth. I confess that I don't think I really understood it until I watched a, a video by a, a chap who, it's behind that link up there, um, a chap called Albert Bartlett, Dr. Albert Bartlett, who's got a series, videos on, a series of videos on the net that talk about the exponential function. I would urge you to watch them because it has implications for oil reserves, it has implications for many, many aspects of our economy. And I'm not sure how many of you have heard the apocryphal tale about the inventor of chess in the Persian Empire. Um, the Persian king wanted to reward him for this great game which he thought was so wonderful and asked the inventor to name his reward. And so the inventor said, well, I tell you what, give me a grain of wheat on the first square of the chessboard, double that on the second square, double that on the third square, and so on. And you see how this grows and grows, and we're, we're not even on the second row. Six, to, to cover the whole chessboard takes that many grains of wheat, which at the time was equivalent to 400 times the harvest of the Persian kingdom. So the exponential function is, is very powerful, very poorly understood, and we don't realize, if, realize it, its effect until it's too late. Currently it means if we, if we, need, if we look to grow at, say, 3% per annum GDP growth, which is a sort of nominal figure that's generally accepted for a developed economy, that means we double our economy every 24 years, cut down twice as many trees, extract twice as much oil, throw twice as much away. Whereas a natural growth curve, as in this one, is, what we, is the sort of system we should aspire to, rather than this continual exponential growth, the effects of which we're seeing today. Another function of interest which is really key. Everybody talks about sustainability, let's protect the future, let's look after the planet. But we have a system which is mathematically geared to value the future at a discount, through discounted cash flow, which is, which is used for every form of project finance, investment you can think of. Discounted cash flow is, is a metrics, metric that we use to value the future. And its effect is that we're discounting the future. It's much more valuable to have the timber today to sell than it is to preserve the forest for the future. And we have this hang up that we think money should have a time value. Why should it have a time value? Because of inflation. Where does inflation come from? 
interest. The two are circular. They're driving each other. If you, if you buy a ticket, let's say you want to go and see the latest theatre show, and I'm not sure what the latest theatre show is, but let's say you've got a ticket for Les Miserables next December. You buy a ticket today, you don't have to pay more money next December when you go, when you go to the theatre. You deliver your token. That's how money should be. It should be a store of value. Why does it need a time value when it's so destructive? Um, no talk about the environment and the effects on the environment that would be complete without mentioning fossil fuels because it drives our economy to su such a great extent. Leaving aside the environmental impact, if you watch Albert Bartlett's exponential function videos, he talks about reserves and these great these great statements that are made by our politicians about we've got 500 years worth of coal reserves or 100 years of natural gas reserves, that's all based on a misunderstanding of the exponential function. And actually, when you apply, the, when you apply proper logic and mathematics to oil and gas reserves, the picture is less rosy. And I'm not saying they're running out tomorrow, but we need to have that in perspective. We cannot think on the basis of we've got hundreds of years to sort it out because we haven't. So I started talking about land values and how private, the private capture of the surplus from the land has created this culture of people grabbing more and more. Um, the people who correct, collect rents on the basis of the location value that is created communally or the resources that are there by virtue of nature are effectively parasites on our economy because they're not creating wealth, they're not contributing, they're not working, they're merely collecting rents. Similarly, creating money from nothing and charging us for the use of it, again, is a parasitical form of behavior because they're not creating wealth by this process. And that's not to denigrate all the achievements of finance over the centuries through the Industrial Revolution and the way we've, we've built infrastructure. But clearly, it has severe disadvantages, and we need to think differently about how we, how we move forward. And I've, uh, I've put together... I've been working with... I've been talking to a lot of people in Occupy, and out of that came something called the Critical Thinking Project, which I've been involved in, in running. And this is bringing together a lot of people who are interested in these questions. And what we've come up with is some fundamental principles for a new economy. The first and foremost is, because it was the original sin, if you like, is to actually re rework the economy so we share the bounty and the surplus from the land which should, by rights, belong to everybody. We then need to abolish interest because it allows those who have more money than they need to exploit those who need it. Um, and because we cannot achieve full employment and technology gives us the opportunity to do so, we should provide the means to life to everyone, irrespective of what they do. In terms of how one achieves this, one of the great problems is the way our money is currently created. And so we propose an interest-free national currency which would possibly be re related to or backed by land in some way. And that could be spent into the economy to fund infrastructure and to build systems. And the running costs would be gathered from the rents from the land. In other words, that would fund public services, it would pu pu uh, fund a citizen's income. So what would a world without interest look like? Because I've had many conversations with a lot of people, we've, we've done a lot of digging around wh what are the pitfalls. But actually, a world without interest sounds rather appealing for a, for a, a start. As Margaret Kennedy said, 50% of what we spend is interest, so everything would halve in cost for a start. We would have infrastructure as we needed it. And how many of you know the story of Guernsey after the Napoleonic Wars in 1820? 
Guernsey was on its knees, poverty struck. The sea walls were crumbling. There were deep car in the roads. The tracks were so deep that the cartwheels couldn't actually get traction. And there was no commercial activity, no markets. And the government set about creating their own currency. And they started spend because they had, they had workers, they had materials, they had all the necessary requisite, requisite materials and, and labor, but there were no English pounds available to actually get the economy moving. So they created their own interest-free currency. Two years later, they opened Market House, no debt. They regulated the money supply by actually applying taxation so that inflation wasn't a problem. And within 10 years, the bankers who were absent when they needed money realized that this was a very prosperous enterprise and managed and lobbied very hard to, to uh, abolish the, the creation of money by the government. And they succeeded by 1836. So I, I would study that. So, so it is possible. Private enterprise. You know, the city wouldn't disappear. We would still have equity investment. There would still be the need to have equity participation. The difference would be that instead of going to your bank and borrowing money for an enterprise and they get their money irrespective of whether you thrive or go bust, they will share, whoever gives you the money will share in the risks and the rewards. Similarly, housing. One of the major problems in housing, what we want as people, as families, as, as individuals, is security of tenure. Ownership is not really the issue. The issue is you want to be able to have control of your destiny and live in the house that you live in, or have the opportunity to move, move elsewhere. Ownership isn't a prerequisite for that. I live in rented accommodation. In November, if my landlord tells me that he wants to sell my house, I have to move. And that goes for anyone in private rented accommodation. And what would a world look like if we actually did give people a citizen's income? And there's a lot of work being done on this. Well, we could abolish state pension. We could abolish unemployment benefits at a stroke because everybody would have the means to life based on their citizen's income, their base level of, of, of living. We could abolish income tax, corporation tax, employment taxes. I won't go into VAT and all the other things because I think there's quite a lot of mathematics that needs to be done to work out what could and couldn't be affordable. And if you think about the dynamic between employer and employee, and us, you think about your own personal circumstance, uh, if you've ever had to be a supplicant for the job, if ever, if ever you've been made redundant and wondering, you know, am I going to get another job, and thinking of what a heavy burden that is, that burden is lifted because it becomes voluntary. You know that whatever happens, you'll survive. And therefore, you can treat with your employer on the basis, not necessarily of equality, but certainly much more equal than it is today. And under those circumstances, why would we need unions? Um, to flesh out the proposals a little more, I've already talked about the land bank currency. Clearly, if one's going to trade internationally, actually, before I get on to that, just think about tax evasion and all the Ferrari over tax havens and the amount that's held offshore. Tax evasion becomes a non-issue. They can't take the land away and hide it. There'll be, you know, tax evasion. All the people in the tax avoidance industry wouldn't have a job. Sorry if there are any here today. Um, but we would need an international trading currency. And the trading currencies already exist. Has anyone heard of the Ormita? Michael Minnelli has talked quite a lot about um, alternative currencies. The Ormita is an international trading currency. There are billions conducted in multilateral trade agreements. So it's not beyond the wit of man to develop an inter international trading uh, framework, not necessarily based on domestic currency, but via the medium of an international currency. Local and community currencies, we're already seeing times of hardship always bring out community currencies, the Brixton pound, the Bristol pound. Um, in Greece, in Cyprus, they're finding means of conducting trade away from the euro. The VIA, hands up, who's heard of the VIA? 
The VIR is one of the most successful currency experiments that's been running for years. It's, it's for small businesses in Switzerland, and they conduct, um, I can't remember the figure, but it's over 2 billion a year through the medium of the VIR. And it's, it's, it's business to business currency. And there's no edict or absolute law that says you only need one currency. And if you're collecting the tax through your national currency, the points about tax avoidance and all the other criticisms that are made of things like Bitcoin actually um, just evaporate. Bitcoin, by the way, is a, if you haven't heard of it, is a computer-generated currency. Uh, it's provoking a certain amount of interest at the moment because it's becoming something of a speculative medium, but um, it's, a, it's yet another currency experiment. I've already talked about enterprise being through equity participation. You, we could also see development of cooperative and mutual models, um, so that will continue. And banking merely becomes a record-keeping exercise and a transaction mechanism, which would be largely be computerized. And you think of the volume of talent that's been sucked into the city and Canary Wharf that could be usefully deployed in actually creating a better world for all of us. Um, how, many people, how many people who actually work in the city studied to come into the city? I, I, gather far, I would guess far fewer than actually arrived. So that's where I think we need to get to, but there are huge obstacles to overcome. Clearly, the banking interests that actually are sitting at the top of this pyramid, and I'm not talking about the people who work in banks, I'm talking about the people who own banks, are not going to let go easily. But it would be in their interest to do so, because I think the alternatives are too dire to contemplate. Um, and also, I think that they could actually begin to see some benefits in what, what is being proposed. In terms of land and resource rights, it's very easy to point the finger at people like the Duke of Westminster and other big landowners. And I think the statistics are that 1% of the UK, or 50% of the UK is owned by 1% of the population, uh, something along those lines. But they are not the obstacle politically. The obstacle is all of us, not me personally, because I don't own a house at the moment, but if you're a homeowner, you are both a beneficiary of the system and a victim of the system. And it's a question of deciding, would you be better off with a new system where you removed the ills of the current system, or are you better un off under the status quo? My submission to everyone, from, a, from the f perspective of the future of mankind, excuse me, future of mankind, as well as your own personal situation today, is that you'd be better off moving on to a different system. And this means to life being conditional in, on employment is so ingrained in our psyche through the media. There's talk of hard-working families, uh, the feckless poor, and you know the, the Protestant ethic, the Asian work ethic. These are all things that we've grown up with and are so inculcated in our psyche that they take quite a lot of examination to get over. But if we can get over these obstacles and we can learn to think differently, then there is the opportunity to thrive. Behind this link is a film called Thrive, coincidentally. Um, and I don't, I don't actually embrace everything that it says. It's quite a long video, but it's quite an inspiring. It's quite good in terms of the analysis of problems, and it's quite an inspiring video, video <laughs> about the possibilities. Now, when I started, I said the result of all this was, or this came about through a lot of discussion with a lot of people, the critical thinking group. And this chap here, Yanish, um, is the one who actually opened my eyes to the problems of land and uh, the lack of a citizen's income. Uh, Fred Harrison, I've, I've interviewed and spent time with. Margaret Kennedy, I've been in correspondence with. Michael Minnelli has been very supportive. And there are many, many other people I've talked to, both within the Occupy movement, academics, and elsewhere. Um, so what I brought to you today is not mine. This is not me saying I've got the answer. What I'm trying to share with you is what I've discovered 
in my research travels, as it were. And finally, before we get on to Q&A, uh, these are some, some sources. The, that's the website for the Critical Thinking Project. Progress and Poverty is available to read on, online, but I would recommend you read Trauma Size Society first. It's a much softer, easier introduction to the subject. That actually links to the interview that I had with Fred Harris, Harrison. Uh, this is the PDF of Margaret Kennedy's book, Positive Money, Social Credit. I, Douglas, I had a problem with it. It took me a long time to actually... I came to the conclusion about citizens' income before I read Douglas, and he, he has a tendency to overcomplicate in terms of the solutions he puts forward but well worth understanding. Web of Debt is Ellen Brown, who's written extensively about the corruption of the American financial system. Uh, these books are well worth reading. Um, this film here is actually not a financial film. It's from the perspective of biologists and soci sociologists. And it talks about all of our evolutionary understanding to date is based on Darwin survival of the fittest, and it's led to this idea that our competitive society is modelling nature. Contemporary biology says that we're much more interconnected and interdependent than we, we used to think. So Darwinism hasn't been negated, it's been augmented by this, this sophistication that actually these organism, organisms need each other to thrive. We are highly dependent on each other for that. Uh, and that, that is well worth understanding. And they're saying, unless we can switch from a competitive to a collaborative form of economy, then we may turn out to be an evolutionary misstep in the universe, which sounds pretty ominous, I know. But uh, it's, it's well worth getting your head around that. It's, it's, it's not financial, it, it's looking at it from a very different perspective. And finally, this here, I was talking to George about this before uh, we started. This guy, Richard Grove, who's one of the most articulate people I've ever heard talking about the American financial system, he went as a young salesman, uh, pretty entrepreneurial, to work for a company that developed software to meet glass, uh, sorry, Sarbanes-Oxley Oxley regulations. And this was related to retention of data. And this software was supposed to ensure that the, the, the data you needed to keep under Sarbanes-Oxley was, was incapable of being erased. And the software was effectively mandated by Sarbanes-Oxley. If you were covered by the act, then you needed to buy this software. He discovered very early in his career with this outfit that there was a back door. And to the non-technical among you, a back door is a means by which someone who knows what they're doing can get in and manipulate the information within the software. And that allowed people to actually remove the very information that the software was supposed to protect. And this was mandated by the government. He tried to take it, to, he tried to whistleblow within the company, he was terminated. He went to the SEC, who told him to go away, and they actually bought the software. Listen to the story. It is highly revealing. He took it to court. He, he couldn't get a, a firm of lawyers to represent him, so he, he learned all about the law and took the court case to court. And over many years, he won. And yet, no judgment was made because, it, because by the time he got to that point, it had fallen out of the statute of limitations. So I will leave you with that opportunity to go and learn for yourself what's going on because you cannot trust what you read in the papers. I don't believe there's a solution within the current paradigm, uh, but I think these ideas may offer a way forward. Thank you. Clive, thank you very much. That was fascinating. Can I pose a little challenge to you, which is that just the other day I was in Moscow for the Institute, and I've spent a little bit of time there for us and some other bodies over the past year. I used to go I guess 30 years ago as a journalist in the very old days. Um, actually, Moscow's a much more fun place now. The skies are bluer, even, uh, than it seemed to be in the old days. And firstly, this is my first question, while the system is very admirable, and of course we'd all love to see the end to pictures of starving children around the world, of course, of course, of course, is there a risk that this society better could be boring? 
Then on Sunday, I came back to see um, a very dear friend who's the widow of a, a distinguished Marxist who died at 96 a bit back, and there's a memorial event coming. So there I was in this Marxist home uh, with a um, uh, beautiful place in Hampstead with lovely bread from a bell-sized part deli and lovely cheese from Italy and coffee from Colombia. Would I still get my cheese from Italy under this new system? It's a rather cheeky question, but um, no, I, would I, it be fun? Would it be I, fun? I think that you've hit upon two of the most fundamental things in this dialogue. And Fred Harrison actually went to the Soviet Union at the time that, they, that it was falling apart. And he urged them not to privatize the land, to actually share the product of the land across the whole of society, which it had been up until that point. Were, and I'll come on to the Marxist angle in a minute. And they didn't. And you... Fred is far more lucid on this than I am, but if you look at the mortality statistics and what's going on for most of the population in Russia, your characterization of Russia being a fun place <coughs> is only for those who are the uh, non-wealth creating rent seekers at the top. For the ordinary Russians, life is exceedingly hard because like most of the society in this neoliberal project, all the wealth is being sucked upwards. So, yes, you're right. It is a fun place if you've got the chips to play the game. Secondly, I've had huge arguments with a lot of people across Occupy, and you may remember the ban banner over St. Paul's that said, capitalism is crisis. Uh, and there was quite a lot of controversy because a lot of people with, within Occupy are not anti-capitalist. And I'm, I'm still having this battle with these died in the wool Marxists who are typically sort of Middle England intellectuals with their, with their exotic tastes. And it is not capitalism that is the problem. And I'm not anti-capitalist. And I'm all in favor of fair trade on a fair and even basis. And therefore, there's no reason why you can't source your forchetta from Italy or whatever it may be. But what is driving our capitalist system, what has perverted our capitalist system, is the, are the foundations on which it's been built. There's nothing wrong with people benefiting from their own enterprise. That is not what I'm criticizing. That is not what George and Douglas are criticizing. It's benefiting from what should be everybody else's that we're criticizing. Does that answer your question? It does in part, Clive. Thank you indeed. Now, there must be other occupiers or cheese lovers in the audience. I'm not talking about <laughs> Marxists or capitalists. Any other questions, sir? Would you um, mind waiting for the microphone, please? Thank you. And telling us who you are. Um, um, is this on? Yes. Uh, my name is Jonathan Price. I'm a partner in a venture capital firm. Um, my uh, question or comment is perhaps um, Marxism isn't where we should look at the moment, as Marxism is, is old hat these days. But of course, there is a very, very uh, growing uh, area of um, finance and investment, uh, which is interest free, which is Islamic finance, uh, which I know uh, from the uh, business school I teach at is of uh, increasing interest to lots of people, both Muslims and non-Muslims. And perhaps um, uh, some focus on that, and perhaps George, the Institute could think about uh, doing something in these lines could, could, be of, could be of interest, and connecting what you've said to what, what they believe might, might help. Yeah, I think that's an, an excellent point. On the question of Marx, I, I wouldn't dismiss Marx. I think, and I can't pretend that I've read him thoroughly, but I've read, I've read derivations of Marx, if you like, people critiquing Marx. He, did, he got the land point and then ignored it completely and focused on the means of production and full employment, uh, which I think is a, is a red herring. But I, I wouldn't dismiss Marx out of hand just because he's old. Henry George is old, but he hit, hit on some fundamental truths that have been expunged. Um, I've talked on a couple of Islamic finance um, events. Um, I don't think it's any accident that Jews, Christians, Muslims, prohibited interests. I think, you know, there was a fundamental reason for that. In the same way that if you read David Graeber's debt the first 5,000 years, there was a tradition of debt jubilees because they realized that, you know, this is mathematically impossible. You can't go on 
increasing the debt and creating these inequalities. You have to wipe the slate clean, let people move back to their land, return the wives back to their husbands that have been commandeered by some warlord. You know, if you look at what's happened in history, this is not a new problem. There was one over there. From Bronze Eye. Um, it was a comment about um, Islamic banking as well, but I've got another comment about the banks and the parasitical nature of them. I mean, largely they're owned by pension funds, which is our money effectively. So, why is that such a barrier if we can get the pension funds to move against the banks? They receive dividends, so there is a circular nature to that interest payment coming into the bank and then getting paid out in dividends. I mean, there is a loss along the way, but there is a transmission from the money the banks make back into our pocket via our pensions in the future from the dividends they've paid? Fair comment. Um, and I'm trying to think where it is, if I can just take you back. Yeah. I think it's behind there. Yes, we are... You know, this is complicated. You know, this is not a them and us, and yes, we are part of the problem, and yes, via pension funds, we do own the banks. But actually, behind that is a new scientist study conducted in, or published in October 2011. And it was an analysis of 40,060 transnational corporations. And what they did, they looked at public registers and directorships. And their analysis came down to 147 what they describe as super entities that actually controlled 40% of this network of 40,060 transnational corporations. So effectively, they were controlling events there. Now, if you think about it, um, that 147, we know about nominee companies, blind trusts, and various ways of, of obscuring shareholdings. So contrary to your assertion, it is not just the pension funds that are benefiting from this. There are hidden interests behind the whole corporate sphere that are accumulating huge amounts of wealth. The Federal Reserve is not neither federal nor reserve. It is a privately owned corporation. The 12 Federal Reserve banks are owned privately. So there is a lot of, there is a lot of central influence going on alongside the institutional head shareholders. And let's not forget the, the extent to which the management of these banks <coughs> are incentivized and rewarded with multi-billion pound packages. So you know, all the incentives in our society are to create this inequality. Uh, and what I'm seeking to expose or, or put in front of you is that it is the structures that are creating this and no amount of regulation or moral indignation is gonna change that. We're, dry, we're trying to drive water uphill, in effect, by trying to regulate these things. Anybody else? Please, can, you know, I, there's, a, there's a lot to critique, I know. Can I make a point, and Jonathan's interesting point about Islamic finance, about the matter of interest there. I had a very fascinating dinner a few months ago with a, a, a friend who's um, a Muslim, she's Saudi, and who wouldn't dream of putting her money in a bank which didn't pay interest on the basis that she wouldn't give the money to the bank for free, but gives the interest each year to charity, which is, of course, the right thing to do. And someone else over dinner remonstrated with her, saying, you shouldn't do this. But a rather eminent imam at the same dinner said, came up with a wonderful concept, which is the Father Ted School of Sharia Thought. Now, I'm only repeating him here, but you may recall that the reason why Father Ted was banished to uh, Craggy Island was that some money from his previous parish, which had been meant to take the children to, uh, to a holiday somewhere, had uh, disappeared and was found in his bank account. And his, ex his explanation was, was that it was only resting. And this imam made the point that essentially the, the, the prohibition on interest in Islam, his words, not mine, wasn't really based on anything in the Quran, where it's very hard to find anything about this, but on the parable of the talents, essentially about leaving money in a bank account or under a tin or whatever, doing nothing. So it's to let the money be used. And I'd be interested to know whether you think if there was no interest being paid, uh, people would allow their money be, to be used properly if there was only an equity route to do it. In other words, a long-term investment rather than a short-term investment. I'm being very critical here, Claire. No, please do. You know, uh, I'm used to it. Um, very interesting. There have been quite a few monetary experiments over the years, um, and I'm no expert. I've had to cover a lot of ground, but I've picked up various things. And one of the concepts is 
the idea of demurrage, where it actually costs you to hold money. And what that does is actually create velocity within the economy. It, it, it compels you to spend the money rather, rather than hang on to it, because it's going to, you, it loses value the longer you hang on to it. Now, we currently have a system that actually, because we accord money a time value of itself, we're encouraged to hoard it. And you only have to look at what's happened through quantitative easing, where 375 billion has been fed into the system to stimulate the economy, allegedly. Where has that money gone? It's gone into the FTSE, it's gone into gold, it's gone into every investment medium you can think of and hasn't hit the real economy. There is no velocity in our money at the moment. The Bank of England is pushing on a piece of string. And so interest is actually inhibiting enterprise rather than promoting it. So if I've answered your point fully enough, that's, that's your answer. Thank you. <laughs> was it full enough? It was, yes, indeed. Thank you. Right. Mark, Bre Mark Brewer from Bronzo again. Um, your back, uh, land back currency, what methodology of valuation would you use? Because you wouldn't be able to use DCF, would you? <laughs> and is it, is it, would it be a bearer currency? So could you exchange that um, currency into your one square metre of land per pound? or the, the actual mechanism I haven't got to grips with um, in, in any great, to any great extent. But if you think about the way in which land is related to gold or, or land is related to, or, or money is related to any other intermediate form of uh, exchange. And all sorts of things have been used for, for um, a currency. You know, you think about tobacco and the, it was used for 200 years in Virginia. Um, I suspect the way it would be done is to reference it in terms of getting land values in today's terms is very easy. Basically, you just need to go around and, and if, if you did a computer trawl of right move for residential property, I, could th I think you could get a very clear idea looking at transactions and properties for sale to get an idea of valuations. Similarly, on the basis of commercial property, you could... I, I don't think it's beyond the wit of man to get to valuations to actually set this in process. One of the great problems... One of the reasons why land is so obscure in our economic debate is that there's very little data been, been brought together in a coherent manner. You think about the data on employment, the data on also all manner of statistics, actually getting comprehensive statistics on land is horrendously difficult and in my view that's been quite deliberate because actually if you pull all that information together valuation is, is not going to be a big deal um, but when you pull it together you begin to see things much more clearly is that well Clive this has been fascinating I realize that people may wish shortly to get back to their business of exploiting and corrupting people and so on but um, <laughs> unless there are Unless there are any pressing points, I'd like to thank you all for coming and to thank Clive for a fascinating presentation. Thank you.